Well, it's been a while since we got together. I think uh, there were a couple of vacations in there, maybe uh, uh, maybe other projects uh, more important than, uh, no, no, not more important <laughs> than foundation work, certainly. No, it's great to be back with you guys. And I've got a handful of questions today that have come in uh, from all sources. So uh, uh, here's number one. Uh, my question is in regards to REITs, real estate investment trusts. I followed the guidance of your configurator tool for a 50-50 portfolio with a 70-30 U.S. international. I have 7% in REITs, but using tools on my Fidelity account, my overall real estate holdings show 16%. Most of the other funds already have some holdings in real estate, which drives up the total. Does this mean I'm actually overweight in this area? An interesting question, Chris. First of all, somebody might not know what the configurator tool is. So I will share a web browser pointed at Paul's website. This is at paulmerriman.com. And if you go to portfolios, the pull down tab and go to the bottom, that's where the portfolio configurator is. Now, he says he has a 50 50 ultimate buy and hold. And I assume he means 50% US, 50% uh, international. Um, or, or do we think that's no, it's bonds? 50 50 stocks and bonds. Okay. So we'll go 50 50 stocks and bonds. And then. He's the 70-30. There we go. Okay, U.S. and international. And uh, we're going to assume that it's tax deferred and best in class. Ease. And if you look at that, then you come over here to the REITs, and he would have 7% in U.S. REITs, and we don't have any international REITs. So that's how he would have gotten to this 7%. But when he goes and I'm assuming he's running something like an X-ray, like a Morningstar X-ray, but he's doing it at Fidelity. And when he looks inside his portfolio, he sees that he has quite a bit more in REITs and he's wondering why. So that, that makes sense. And the, the reason why is that other funds, large cap blend funds, small cap blend funds, large cap value funds, Sometimes they exclude REITs, sometimes they don't exclude REITs. And so you can think of it as there's a little bit of overlap or leakage. And, and there's actually overlap between all of these funds. That's, that's not unusual to have some overlap. So is he over? That's kind of a personal decision. It's not overweighted based on our, our back testing necessarily or the way we recommend the model. But if he feels uncomfortable with it, he may lower his read amount. Um, it's kind of interesting when you think about it. It also means that somebody who's using a taxable account where we don't recommend REITs is actually probably still getting a little exposure to REITs. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's kind of a judgment call on his part, but there's nothing wrong with what he's done or nothing out of line with our recommendations. Well, it sounds like he could just, at this point, eliminate the REITs. Yeah, still he could eliminate REITs and, and still, still have, have some exposure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's entirely up to him, and it and it does depend on which funds he's using. The different funds will have different degrees of overlap um, in the in the recommended set. So, for example, we don't have the facility here to to show that difference. But if I went to Fidelity, it's a different set of funds. And he said he's doing this at Fidelity. Uh, um, oh, yeah. These these funds might have more or less overlap into the REIT category. Yeah. So well and and also it it surprises me uh how often I find uh, exposure to asset classes we wouldn't expect. I looked at a small cap value uh, fund uh, at uh, at DFA, and I noticed it had one percent in large cap growth. Now I'm guessing what that is is they have uh, they have strategies uh, establishing the conditions of sale, 
And it may be yes. that is something they were holding and their strategy says to keep holding it. And, and, and so they're sitting with some large cap growth in what is basically a small cap value of portfolio. So there, there, there is that to deal with when you start checking into the x-rays. It's very common to find, for example, the VBR, uh, that's a small cap uh, Vanguard small cap value has got a whole bunch of mid cap in it. So uh, that's that's a fund that the average size company is about six billion instead of two or three billion. Second one has to do with indexes. Are they all created equal? And uh, and I really enjoyed this one because uh, I thought it was kind of fun to go through the five uh, market indexes from one at T. Rowe Price, a couple at Fidelity, uh, including the Fidelity U.S. total uh, market index that is the is the uh, free, it's, it's, it's the zero cost uh, uh, fund for that particular asset class. Uh, and then, and then the Vanguard total market index, and I was actually kind of surprised. I don't know if you guys looked at them. In fact, if if you looked at it, go ahead and speak up and tell me what you found. I, I did. I not only did I look at it, I can share the back test at uh, Portfolio Visualizer if you want to take a peek and we can see yeah. how they compare. Sure. Yeah. So, I. Uh, if you want to compare four things, by the way, this is a special trick. You you uh, you go to Portfolio Visualizer and you say you want to backtest a portfolio, and it normally only allows you three portfolios. But if you come up here under Benchmark and specify a ticker, you can add the fourth one. So that's how I got four in here, and it only goes back to September two thousand eighteen. But I was surprised they differed as much as they did. The compound annual growth rates uh, went from 9.87% to 10.3%. So that's, you know, considering that they're all supposed to be essentially the same thing. Did you happen uh, to look at the benchmark they used, Chris? Well, they we use, can't. that's his question. That's the essence of the question is he yeah. uses, they, they use different um, indexes. And, you know, indexes are more or less transparent. They rebalance more or less frequency, frequently. They um, filter on profitability or they don't, right? So the indexes are different. And uh, I think as a starting point, his assumption that you'd want to look for one that's low, low cost is good. That's not a bad starting point. And in fact, the Fidelity Zero, right. I think, uh, is the highest performing here at the 10.31 compound annual growth rate. So, so I think that instinct is good. Um, T. Rowe Price has the highest expense ratio. Yep. So um, it's not surprising to me that it had the lowest return. Um, but it's also a little bit more active than the others. Um, so it's just, it's kind of interesting. They're, you know, they're all index funds, uh, but they are going to vary. They're going to vary a little bit. Yeah. And, and, and also you mentioned the T. Rowe price is, is more actively managed and has a higher uh, tax cost. Uh, it is, it is costing in earnings according to the Morningstar um, tax uh, uh, tax efficiency evaluator. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's 0.57, almost, almost six tenths of 1% as opposed to the Vanguard is 0.37. So there's, there's a fifth of 1% right there difference. Also something that is interesting is the range of number of securities. Yeah. He wrote, Go ahead. Do you have them, Daryl? I don't, but that was a that was the thing I was going to say is that you know an index is tries to replicate a, a large market with a few stocks with, with Some fewer do. stocks, a subset. Yeah, and, and so the question is, how many? How big is that subset? T. Rowe Price holds one thousand one hundred and eighty four. That's the, the the lowest. The highest is a Fidelity uh, total market index of. 
3,930. Vanguard is 3,856. Uh, and the Fidelity, the one that's free, is 2,679. So the, those are huge differences. And what we've been taught uh, or told, uh, whether whether we believed it or not, is the more companies you hold, uh, the better off you are. Uh, and and uh, and and so when you look at the returns, I think what you found, and I did too, looking at five years of performance, uh, was that uh, the fidelity was ten point three four. Ah, here it is. No, no, no. Sorry, and ten point two one for the Vanguard. Those those are the two top performers. It's also interesting if people want to take a check to to look at how much they hold of the different companies. Now, it probably wouldn't matter whether you own 6.57% of your portfolio in Apple or 6.45 or 6.44 or 6.53, but in each case, they, they are not exact. They are not going to look alike. And I suspect there will be years that they'll have a fair amount of tracking error when you've only got 1184 companies uh, there you could have quite a tracking error from the uh, uh from something like the vanguard or the fidelity more broadly diversified so uh there you go i guess that's more than he asked for so, uh <laughs> well, let's see and what isn't they got it Chris, doesn't doesn't Avantis have a total market fund, but it actually has a small cap value tilt? Uh, Avantis, yeah, we recommend uh, for our large cap blend the AVUS fund, and it does nudge in the direction of a little bit smaller and a little bit more value. And the other thing is, uh, uh, even though you, it's called a total US, essentially, it. it I think it's called, I'm not sure if it's called total US, but uh, it, um, it, it, it doesn't trade like an index fund in two ways that are important. Number one, uh, it's not public about the selection criteria, meaning that nobody can front run its trades. So nobody can get in front of it and say, oh, yeah, on Friday, they're going to have to sell a bunch of this. So I'm going to buy some because it's going to it's going to go up in value. And number two, they can trade when it's appropriate for the best return. They're not tied to some schedule like once a year where index funds are. So it it does have some advantages. And that's why th those are some of the reasons it's our best in class. Actually, that's another reason why why returns could be different is if they if they reset their their uh, their weightings or the stocks in the index and the weightings of those stocks in the index on a different schedule. Yeah, the reconstitution rules and all the, yeah all of that matters. Uh, so I think Paul, you you exhibited the right behavior, and I did too. I'd I'd go if I'm making this choice, I'd go look at Morningstar. I would go look at Portfolio Visualizer. I would also read about the index that they use and Google it and find some pros and cons. And um, in this particular category, the differences are going to be very small because the total market is, uh, it's a commodity and the, the differences should be small. But in small cap value, the differences could be dramatic. It could be, you know, a percent or more. So you got to be even more careful there. <laughs> It's an interesting uh, decision uh, that you made on the AVUS uh, because it is, on average, the companies are smaller. They aren't small companies, but they're smaller. Uh, and I don't mean that they don't have uh, Apple in there and they don't have uh, Microsoft in the portfolio but they extend past the 500 and and uh and as you say uh well and and as we would guess they also uh have some sort of a a quality of 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 the financials and the earnings mm -hmm. that that is a judgment that they make 
So what we've done is in a portfolio maybe of many different asset classes, what we are using to represent the large cap blend is is uh, is a fund that is 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 much smaller and more value oriented. And and so, would you also if somebody said I want to have all of my portfolio in U.S. large cap blend, would you say I think you ought to put it in uh, AVUS? Or would you say that AVUS is more appropriate in a portfolio of many different asset classes together? Is there any difference in who would own those two? Uh, yes, I think there's a difference. And I think it, it's what do you believe and what do you care about? If you care about following the market and being as close to what you hear in the news as possible, you should buy an S&P 500 fund. If you believe that there are advantages to having slightly higher quality companies that are priced a little bit lower and uh, maybe, you know, even stretching into uh, smaller companies, then you should and, and filtering on momentum and a number of other things and having hidden reconstitution and not having, you know, if you believe these benefits and you're okay tolerating the tracking error, then you should invest in something like AVUS. Yeah. And and what people then need to understand is AVUS is likely to underperform in a year where large cap growth is really strong. Yeah. There will be times when it doesn't do as well. That, yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, yeah. The, the, if you want a different return, if you want a different destination, you got to tolerate different. a different ride. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fair enough. I have read two funds for life. By the way, I addressed this one on my own, but I had wanted to get your, your feedback. A fellow who's 79 has plenty of in, he meets his, his monthly, monthly living expenses with social security and a military pension. Um, uh, he's, uh, taking his RMDs required minimum distributions, and he's paying the taxes and placing the balance in a non-qualified brokerage account. So he's saving and uh, he is trying to figure out how does he, he's read the book. Now, how does he put the book to, to work for him to, to, to do what he should in a two funds for life portfolio as a retiree? I, it's only fair. Yeah, I probably okay. should have had a chapter in there on like what uh, two funds for life for retirees who are independently wealthy. <laughs> That's it. That's exactly what I was going to say. I'll have to. I'll have to add it next time. Well, I uh, where I would go if I were him, and, and I first of all, I'm sorry I don't have that chapter. But since I don't have the chapter, let me show you how I would approach that problem. I would I would do it this way. I would go to appendix, I think it's appendix A or one in the book. And there's this set of tables. And what they show is how uh, different approaches to two funds for life actually played out in the past. And by the way, Daryl helped me in the creation of these tables and this heat map. This is one of Daryl's, uh, in my opinion, most valuable contributions to the book is very helpful. And the way you read these is that every one of these matrices has uh, across the top the, the minimum balance you're willing to hold in small cap value. So it could be you go to zero when you're in retirement. It could you go to be you go to 10%, 20% or 30%. And then down the left-hand side is the multiplier you use approaching retirement. Uh, time. So, you know, if you're using two times age and you're 50 years before retirement, that's 100% that you would put in small cap value. Um, so he's in retirement. He can ignore the left hand side, right? He doesn't, there, there's no multiplier that matters for him because he's not ramping down. He's, he's just in retirement. And what each of these shows is some different aspect of how things played out in the past. There's the, uh, the first one is the safe withdrawal rate. Um, the, and this is a conservative 40 year safe withdrawal rate. So 
if I'm in retirement, I look at this and I go, well, if I have 0% in small cap value, it says historically a target date fund portfolio um, was 3.84% safe withdrawal rate. If I put 10% in small cap value, I almost get to 4%. And remember, these are 40 year safe withdrawal rates. So that get you, gets you to a 3.95% 40 year safe withdrawal rate. At 20%, it was a little higher at 402. And at 30%, it was 4.15%. So, so step one, I would look at it and go, well, if I hold a little, a little small cap value, I can increase my resilience to sequence of returns. But of course, that came with some risk. And so he could come over here and look at the maximum drawdown at age 95, which is probably the, the worst case scenario for him because he's in retirement. And, and this assumes you've achieved, achieved some steady states. And this 24% worst case drawdown is for a target date fund in retirement. But if you add 10% small cap value, it's interesting. It actually improved the worst case drawdown at 95 because your money lasted longer. If you added 20%, though, it increased the volatility to where you might see a 31% drawdown. And at 30%, you might have seen a 47% drawdown. So, so that would be the second thing to consider is how much risk am I taking on? And then the last thing you could do is you could come over and look at the medium total dollars at retirement. These are in real inflation adjusted dollars and the median ending balance. And this assumes a 4% fixed withdrawal rate. So you're taking out 4% every year, increasing with inflation. And you could ratio these two. You could say, well, for a 100% target date fund, I started with 2.2 million median and I ended with 2.2 million median. That means it's got a pretty good chance of preserving your nest egg as you go through retirement. But if you went 30%, you went from 3 million as the median starting point to 7.1 million as what you leave behind. So you grew your nest egg in retirement by carrying that added small cap value. So again, I apologize, I don't have a chapter on it, but I think to the interested student, and hopefully that's what he is, he could look at this chart and realize that by adding some small cap value to a target date fund and using that in the mix, he could include increase his safe withdrawal rate. He could um, increase the amount he leaves to heirs. He could take out a little money while, while a little more money while he's alive if he wants, um, and he can see how much risk he's going to have to tolerate to do it. So, Chris, just to clarify. The idea that you could have this at at age ninety five, uh, you could have a a, a loss of uh, let's look at the twenty percent column of thirty one percent in that in that year. That obviously is because the market <laughs> went down uh, a lot, and 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 the odds of that happening for each of us at age ninety five, uh, it's not going to happen to all of us. It, it will happen to a relative few. Is that a fair comment? These back tests are based on going back to 1970. So uh, what do we have? Is that uh, 50, almost, it's 52 years. When I wrote the book, it was about 50 years, 50, 51 years. Okay. So, so one way to think of it would be that, well, there's about a 2% chance that I'll experience a year that is the worst right? One out of 50. Uh, if you had a longer history, there's there's probably something lower that happens 1% of the time or half a percent of the time or a tenth of a percent of the time. We don't really know. But for planning purposes, you know, to plan for the worst thing that happened in the last 50 years, probably not bad. That's good. I, I appreciate that. Did you have anything you were going to add? I think we, I hope I at least gave him a little bit, even if it's not the chapter he wants. <laughs> but you were, you were saying earlier before we got on air here that uh, uh, you probably in the future, this is something you're looking at as a project. Yeah, I probably should I take a look at, uh, at writing it. Yep. Good. Okay. 
Uh, Daryl voted. Daryl, we've lost Daryl. He's not with us right now, but he voted with a big hand up in the air saying, yeah, go ahead. I think you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, here is a question. The one thing I struggle with is establishing an expected rate of return. I'm intending to use the U.S. four fund portfolio. What is your expectation for future returns? For example, the next 40 years. And uh, so is Daryl coming back, by the way? <laughs> we hope so. We hope so. Um, so what is what is your thought process when you uh, – are, are building a, a hypothetical future and what return do you use? Uh, I, I usually go to portfolio visualizer and do a Monte Carlo simulation. So um, if, and our listeners can do that, it's not particularly hard. And then what it does, and you can see these in my book too, is it produces a range of results so that you can see over time how you might get, lucky and have a high a high number or you might get unlucky and have a low number and that i find quite comforting because i'm a long-term investor for the most part uh, and so when i look at it i think well if the market is down that's what i was supposed to expect it happens occasionally and it calms me yeah. And if the market is up, I look at it and think, well, it'll probably come down again. <laughs> but on average, over the long term, it should be up. And I don't, I guess I'm fortunate that I'm not in a position where I have to, where the difference between a historical average plus or minus one or 2% is going to make or break us. And I would like to think most retirees are in that position. If you have a safe withdrawal rate, uh, if you can live within something like a 4% safe withdrawal rate, history says that that'll work in all all of the scenarios tested, including the very worst of times. So if people are on the news saying that we're in a period of low return and low expectation, you should just pat yourself on the back and say, I right-sized my withdrawals for that kind of a scenario and be calm, try to be calm. Um but uh, I, yeah, I try. I try to think of it as a range that can vary a lot and not really pin it down. Yeah. So here's um, an, another way one could could look at it. Um, it is unknown. We it, we do know the past. We know the S and P five hundred had a best forty year return of twelve point five, an average of eleven, and worst case of eight point nine. Now we bring in this particular case, uh, this person is looking at using the four fund strategy, U.S. four fund. What do we know about that? Well, we know that the compound rate of return of that strategy was about two percent better than the S and P five hundred, and pretty much across the board. So, if we wanted to be really conservative. We could say, okay, I'm going to, in essence, say that I'm taking the risk of doing better than the S&P 500, but I certainly shouldn't do worse long term, mm -hmm. which means I would be comfortable saying, okay, I'm going to make the, 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 the least nine and the best 12, and, and that that's the range I'm probably likely to experience even though the four fund strategy would suggest much higher potential returns than that, but not lower, but not lower. I think that's uh, uh, that's important. He says that uh, about seven years ago, we recorded a podcast discussing the all value worldwide asset allocation and uh, for it, that it was recommended for young people. He is young. He's 33. Uh, and um, and so he's doing that. Now, his concern is, and I love this concern, value hasn't been as good recently as, as uh, the blend has been or growth has been. Um, but he said, uh, 
if value stocks continue to lag over the next two to three decades, <laughs> which it, it could happen. I mean, we have never seen value lag for two to three uh, decades. It doesn't mean it couldn't do well and then lag again. Oh, you're back. Welcome, Daryl. So, so the, um, the, the, his question is, what should he be doing as he gets older to start to to lower the 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 risk of this portfolio by going from the all value to maybe some sort of a blend between value and and uh, and and growth? And Daryl, I bet you've got uh, what is it H two that would let us see these different portfolios and the implications of balancing. Well, well, while Dar Daryl's pulling that up, I got I got to say I love the way he asks the question. Assuming value stocks continue to lag over the next two to three decades, should I double down and continue to hold them? You know, or or should I diversify? The answer is you should diversify if they're going to do that. <laughs> oh yes, of that's an easy to answer question. That's an easy one. <laughs> The problem is we don't know. Yeah, yeah, we don't know. Okay, there's H two. Good. So, what H two gives us is the ability to look at all of our portfolios over the last fifty three years, and look at them not only in terms of re of uh, record returns by the decade. And by the way, not on this page, but in the same series of, of tables is one that shows every year's performance. But for us to look at not only the good years, there were 44 of them, I'm sorry, there were 42 to 44 profitable years. Turns out the worldwide all value was profitable more times than any of the other strategies, portfolios. Um, and 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 so while it didn't have much blend in it, I mean it's supposed to be all value, but you you get some some growth and blend in those portfolios just by default. Um, but it was generally the the good times were were better than the other strategy. So. Uh, maybe that was just the, the roll of the dice that that happened to be. But when we look at the negative years of the worldwide all value, uh, there were nine losing years uh, versus uh, for the, uh, let's say that you went to the worldwide four fund where you'd have some value and some blend. Uh, there were... Uh, 11 years total losses on in those 11 years 153.5% for the worldwide four fund strategy but with the worldwide all value the total loss losing years added up to 144.8% so while it may seem like it is be it, it is lowering the risk by moving towards a more diversified portfolio of both growth and value, at least over the last 53 years, that that risk is, is not, difference in risk is not significant. Having said that, will one of you be willing to overrule me on that? Well, the only thing I would say is you've often made a a, a, a point that a half a percent is a big deal. Yep. And the worldwide four fund had an 11.9% CAGR over the last 53 years, and the worldwide all value had a 12.6. Now, far be it from me to criticize Paul Merriman, but <laughs> there is there is that. Um, so does, does that suggest that he shouldn't be thinking about moving over to the uh, four fund strategy, which is a more balanced uh, portfolio of growth and value and large and small and U.S. and international. Um, how old is this the 33 year old? Yeah. Yeah. I see no reason to to do that at that age. 
for me personally. What about at age 50? Yes, I would. That's my yeah. opinion. My opinion. So, well, that's all we have. Because that's it was it'll smooth the ride. It'll help. It'll help preserve to a certain extent what you what you have built up potentially. Um, it's, well, it's all really, it's all a game of probabilities, right? And so, isn't, I, isn't the by real doing that, you're. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Daryl. I was going to say it's it's all a game of probabilities, and by doing that, you increase the probability that you'll your ride will be smoother. Um, but don't you do that with fixed income? Isn't that the real mm-hmm. move he needs to be making at age fifty, rather than, or do you think he needs to add fixed income um, and broaden his diversification? Well, so that's an interesting question. If you look at this, this is add, this is adding this is a two fund portfolio. So it's the S and P five hundred, and uh, uh, the small cap value. And if you look at down here, if you look at the allocation to fixed income, or, or, well, equity allocation. Okay, so reverses the al- allocation to fixed income. You can sort of see how things change down here. So the answer to your question is yes, you can do it that way too. I think you could do it either way. Um, it depends. It depends on on your inclination, I guess. What would you say, Chris? You look well, pensive. I, I, well, the other piece I would lay on top of this is the behavioral piece, and I think one of yeah. the questions people are asking when they ask about these mid course corrections and changes, and you know, should I go from such a concentrated position to one that's a little bit more diversified? It's not just maybe that they're second guessing the strategy they've been in because it has underperformed. I think it's also a little bit of regret avoidance. I think people are thinking, uh, you know, if if I go through another five years of underperformance, I'm going to look back and think I was an idiot. You know, I was really stupid. I should have done something different. Where if you and this is one of the great things about a four fund solution or a 10 fund solution is that it's much harder to look back and say, I didn't own something good. You own some great things probably, and you own some stuff that was okay maybe, right? So I I think uh, I, as much as I hate to see people give up on assets that have underperformed for a while because you run the risk of essentially selling low and buying high because you chase the thing that has done well, I think there's a uh, the the most important part is getting into something that the investor can stick with. And if that means going from all value to all value plus large blend, uh, it, I'd be totally fine with that. I actually am a bigger fan of large blend than small blend, um, just because I know that small growth has historically underperformed. So I might even nudge in that direction first, but uh, I, yeah, I, I, I would just lay on top of that, that I hear, I think, in the background that, that this person's worried about regret avoidance and and not being in something that has done well. So adding it would help address that. Um, when I, when my old firm uh, first started using the DFA funds, and we learned all about this Fama and French work uh, in the early to mid 90s. Uh, there was a firm that worked with DFA, a very well-known firm, and they did what they thought was the right thing for their clients. They put them all in value, all of their clients in the equity portion of their portfolio was all in value. And it was a period of time that value was just horrible uh, compared to the blend. And uh, the company didn't go out of business, but they, in essence, started over because because they lost so much business. People were just not willing to be that out of sync for that long. Uh, And it wasn't long after they gave up that value made another strong move. I mean, this is this is part of my presentation for the. Uh, AAII uh, October 11th. Uh, 
I'll be speaking for one hour about the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, around value, small cap value investing. It's an amazing asset class, but it just isn't for everybody. Now, I would go so far as to say a little bit of it is absolutely for everybody. How little that bit is is debatable, but uh, I, I, where where it's not even noticeable. It's not noticeable that you're underperforming much when you do. And by the way, it's not so noticeable when you outperform because it's not going to be an immediate life changer. It, it These things happen over long periods of time. So, so uh, yeah, I, I like both of your comments. Uh, now, let's see here. We are on uh, the Avantis funds. The Avantis funds use the quality factor to get better returns. Why don't all small cap value funds lean in that direction? There you go, Chris. Well, so, some of it's history, right? Some of it is uh, the way the indexes were constructed and people hesitate to change the way they've constructed their indices. Uh, some of it is, um, some of it is copied, right? There are a lot of funds that know about filtering on quality and financial metrics and filtering on momentum. And so, you know, it's not unusual to find some of that in different funds. When I do my best in class analysis, I'm just trying to find the ones that have the most in a way that adds up to the best. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I still feel like Avantis in the small cap value is the best and I'm comfortable with that for now, but we'll rerun the analysis in another year and a half, I think, or so. I know people are probably getting antsy, aren't they? Well, I d didn't I do it just, uh, I just know. last year. <laughs> I know. I, I think there are people who want you to do it way more often, maybe monthly. Yeah, probably. Uh, did we do the one about the theoretical results? How have real results compared to theoretical results? Did we talk about that one? I don't think so. I, I would love for Daryl to share this graph he put together about results from two different periods of time. Because I'm going to, he, he will show us the real results, uh, theoretically, uh, <laughs> from an earlier <laughs> period of time. And then we will see what happened following that period of time. Now, this is what we knew as of the end of 1969 about the what happened in the stock market from 1927 to 1969. Notice that the S&P 500 outperformed uh, large cap value by three tenths of 1%. Small cap blend outperformed uh, small cap value by three tenths of 1%. That's what we knew as of 1969. And so, what we probably did is we overweighted large cap blend over large cap value and small cap blend over small cap value. Would you guess that's a possibility? Possibility. What happens for the next uh, the next period of time, 1970 through 2023, through what? Through through August, through May or June? Do you remember? I think it was. I think it was May. May. Okay. And all of a sudden, value does large value does way better than large blend, and 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 small value does way better than uh, than small blend. So it's not that we wouldn't have done just fine, because we were going to put together a diversified portfolio. We just thought maybe we should overweight things a little bit to take advantage of what we knew from the past. Uh, and I will say, it's interesting, Daryl, that when I looked at these numbers from 1928 and from 1970 through 2022, they change a little bit. 
just an extra half a year here and there has an impact oh, yeah. on the uh, long-term result. So here's what so neatly happens when we take the uh, uh, the curtain away from the whole period, how you would have done, and it's so neat and tidy when you look at the whole period, and maybe we'll see, oh, there it is, and see how nicely you start with large <laughs> blend and then you make more with large value and more with small blend and more with small a value. So that's the way we know the history. And yet we could have taken a position uh, at any period long ago that would have been different than what has worked out so neatly uh, for the academics and for people who are presenting this information. Is there a lesson in there for you guys of any sort? Be prepared to be surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And, and of course, when we look at shorter periods, the differences between one asset class and another over one year can be 20, 30, 40%. It takes time to make these things look palatable and easy to do. But living through it obviously is so different. Yeah, I I, I like that, Daryl. That was a, that was a, a a good a good lesson. I thought. Okay, and um, and and he asked the question: How have real results compared to to theoretical results? Something. Another question I think is important here, Daryl, is. The results of the fine-tuning table for, let's say, small cap value. We have a standalone small fine-tuning table that shows small cap value compared to different percentages of bonds. We got another one that compares small cap value to the S&P 500. But what was the small cap value that was used to build that portfolio in terms of uh, how hypothetical is it? Remembering that the past, whether it really happened or didn't, is still hypothetical because you 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 cannot buy it. You cannot actually use it to uh, to build your future. So this is the uh, the fine tuning table for uh, S and P. 100% S&P to 100% small cap value. So we're not necessarily talking about how you divide these two up, but what you can see is on the far left are the returns from 1970 through 22 for the small for S&P 500 and on the right is the returns for small cap 100% small cap value this this column right here. So these are from the same funds that are used to build the ultimate buy and hold. Uh, tables. And those, for the most part, are actual funds um, that could have been bought at the time. As as far back as available. Right. Sometimes early, sometimes particularly back in the early part of this period, they're, they're uh, filled in with, as, as Chris mentions, they're filled in with, with uh, a, a pseudo- uh, value and and it's uh, described in Chris's uh, formulation of the Ryman regress terms. I think um, in the case of small cap value, though, going back to 1970, we have DFA index data, yeah, yeah. and then we burden it with what we view as a realistic expense ratio. Right. I believe that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So we don't have any Ryman regress here. Uh, probably, table. probably not in in these two asset classes okay. in the S and P five hundred and the small cap value. Yeah, that's a good point. Probably not. But so, for emerging markets and REITs going back to nineteen seventy, yeah. uh, actually, in the case of REITs, I think we get pretty close with seventy two. I think, yeah. Uh, with but with emerging markets, for example, there's there's not much data before I think it's nineteen ninety. So. Yeah. Uh, it there, there's a fair number in there where we try to find uh, either 
a future sequence that, that correlates well, or we use a regression analysis to estimate what would have been the right return. And the only other choice, and some people do this too, is just substitute a different asset class. And we, we have done that in the past, but it's been a number of years since we did that. No, I mean, so so some of this, again, it's all hypothetical because you can't, because you can't, you, you can't invest in it. Um, but a lot of it is, is real time results. Uh, and one of the things that is, I think, interesting, when you look at a page of returns over the last, for example, 95 years that you can get from, we get from DFA and their matrix book. What is so unique about any year? Well, every year was unique to the extent that the history that made that year what it was. But the end result, the number, is very common because you will see that number or close to it over and over and over again uh, through the history. Now, I don't know that you ever see a year that's exactly a 10% return on the on the S&P 500. Uh, if I recall, there's no actual year that it was exactly 10. But for understanding how these prices work and how markets, what they do to your money, looking back at all that range of numbers, that's what it does to your money. It spits out a range of returns that can be extremely wide from 50% down to uh, 100% up and, and a lot of stuff obviously in between. But but I think it is a reasonable representative when we look at those. those. Now, you also have another, I don't know whether you have it handy or not, uh, Daryl, but that piece that you did from 1928 to 2000, ah, this was the topic we wanted to discuss. The piece from 1928 to 2022, the fine-tuning table, I think this comes from question the question number eight in the list, right, Paul? You uh, want to read it? Okay. It says here, uh, if one of the most important decisions is identifying, ah, yes, our risk tolerance and building an asset allocation based on the limits of how much we're willing to lose, it seems like the period I used to create that history is very important. If we look back 50 to 75 years, the losses of an all equity portfolio is acceptable. But if we look back to 1929, the worst cases are catastrophic. How are we supposed to pick the period that is realistically meaningful? I love that question. And and uh, do you have that by chance, Daryl? Okay, so uh, here's a typical fine tuning table format. Um, bonds on the left and 100% equity on the right. And this equity is 50% S&P 500, 50% small cap value. And here's the, the, and it goes from 28 to 22 or 23, I think we'll see on the next page. But but here's the period of time he's talking about right here is 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, where you had at least three huge losses in a row in the equity portfolio. So yeah, if you, if you, go back that far um yes your your volatility or your worst drawdown um will be a lot worse so will by the way so will your best gains if you look at what happened in 33 it was up almost 90 percent so and then 48.5 percent and 49.9 percent um in yeah, uh 35 and 36 in the, in the 40s, yeah. there were a couple of 50s and yeah so, yeah, some crazy, um, just, crazy just stuff. to try to defend uh, the possibility that it won't be this bad, knowing though that it could be this bad, because it was about this bad to the the uh, technology index in the two thousand through two thousand two, it was down over eighty percent. 
So it, 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 it's possible. But I think there's something people need to understand. Back in those days, liquidity was very low. And only about 10% of Americans had any money in the stock market, for example, in 1929. And by 1930, I'm sure it was even fewer people had money in the stock market. But but so you not only, uh, some people say, well, the reason the market has done well over the long term is because you had these really great years in 1933 and 35 and 36. But we also had these absolutely terrible years, remembering to recover from a 50% decline it takes a 100% gain. And, and, and so what we're looking at here is partly what comes from a, a relatively illiquid market. Now, we had a relatively illiquid market on October 19th, 1987, when the market went down 20% in one day. So it's not like these things can't happen in modern days. But the question is, uh, oh, and I might add, I might add that if I don't have it from 1928 in my head, but from 29 to 38, if you dollar cost averaged into the market, you came away with about a 60% gain. If you lump sum into the market, like you put in $10,000, you were probably left with uh, I don't know, 30 or three or four, a third. Three or four thousand dollars. You lost most of your money if you were lump sum. But if you put money in there annually and took advantage of those big declines, uh, you you came out you you came out okay. Now, Chris, you are the one that I think feels the strongest uh, that it's really important. And I'm not I, I'm not saying you're wrong at all that it's important to see this. How do we as young investors, how do we internalize this? How do we think about this? Do we think of it like it's, a, it's an opportunity for me if I'm a young person? I may not be working, but if I had money, I would be dollar cost averaging into a market that's collapsing or what? Give us, give us your overview. Well, a couple of things come to mind. Uh, one is that uh, even for investors who rode through this this huge decline of 90% in the market, if they rode it out, they did well. And, and I think one of the most important things I want a young investor who's thinking about investing in the market to learn is the importance of writing it out of of uh, investing more like Rip Van Winkle. Dollar cost average in and look away, live your life, work hard, increase your, your income. Don't get wrapped up in the day-to-day -day volatility. Now, I you know, it's a, a, a very fond desire of my heart that this generation won't have to go through that. Yeah. But, but there's a truth, and that's the second thing that came to mind. And the truth is there is no absolute bottom. So when we talk about the worst case drawdown that somebody experienced since 1970, it would be a lie to tell them they can't experience something worse than that. Um, it might also be a lie to tell them that the worst they could experience is what they saw in 1928, uh, because it may never be that bad across their entire lifetime. Yeah. The, the truth is that these are random processes. Um, the, that the best modeling we have for them when you look at them statistically across all the data we have is that the, the closest model is that it's random, that it's got a randomness to it. It's based on earnings growth, right? That's like the data, but there's a huge amount of noise around it. And that noise comes from human behavior, emotion, news of the day, um, you know, day-to-day -day change in economic conditions, world events. I mean, there's just a lot of random and randomness cannot be bound. So if, if I really, really wanted to communicate it to somebody, I would have to have a statistical conversation and say, you know, you're, 
you've got about a 2% chance of this kind of a drawdown and a 1% chance of this kind of a drawdown. And I don't actually have that at my fingertips. And I'm not sure how many people would understand it, right? I, I don't know how many people have a statistical mind to think about it that way. So it's a, it's a very difficult piece, I think, in deciding how to communicate with with people to help them understand the risk that they're taking. And I you can tell I'm still grappling with it. I haven't figured it out. Well, I, I will say this in working towards my presentation uh, on October 11th, uh, I've been thinking about putting together a period of accumulation and a period of distribution and uh, and to use 6040 throughout. It's not illogical to put away money 6040 for the whole for your whole life. I mean to invest like that and to and to take it out like that. It, it's it's not a terrible decision. Lots of people believe that a 6040 is a tremendous portfolio because it gives you defense and it gives you offense. And it would address maybe the the feelings of fear that some people might have because it's one thing to look what happens over there at the the 50-50 strategy the 100% equity and right next to it is the S&P 500 but when i look at the 60-40 during the 28 to 37 period and then the 38 to 47 period i mean i all of a sudden get a a, a much greater sense of uh of of acceptance then scare me and so it 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 may be for some people even though i know for 20 and 30 year olds maybe even 40 year olds we'd like them to be almost all equities there is a case that if we could remember some 23 percent of millennials will not touch the stock market well maybe they'd be willing to touch it if they understood how it is done when it's in combination that is something that is defensive to go along with this very scary, risky stock market stuff. But I, I think that those those columns that show the combinations of equity and fixed income look pretty good. Now, Daryl, take us to the bottom of the page because the bottom of the page is my favorite part. There we have that that thing that we love about every fine-tuning table. It gives you the compound rate of return. And you can see it right there. The, the combination of the two, 100% equity, was 50-50, 11.8% versus the S&P 500 at 9.9. Now, Somebody help me on this, because you guys are the numbers folks. Uh, well, you're more than the numbers folks, but you're really good at numbers. <laughs> that standard deviation difference. When I look at the downside, the downside isn't very different. When I look at the upside, the upside is, is different. How much of that higher standard deviation is because of the stuff that happens bigger and more profitably to the 50-50 than the S&P 500. Can you guess that? Because we don't mind volatility on the upside, do we? Well, you can see the worst case drawdown for the S&P 500 was 83%. Uh, and the worst case drawdown for the 100% 50-50 was 87%. So there was a 4% increase to the downside at the you know the worst down so uh you know there's a fair amount of that volatility that showed up to the downside back in the 20s yeah so if you had if you had 10 she started out with ten thousand dollars when this hit your worst drawdowns then you had what sixteen and a half hundred sixteen and a half or uh, 1,660 yeah. left with the S&P and you had not quite 1,300 left with a small cap value. Um, and even the 60-40. Is that a big difference at that point? No. 
No, it's bad that it went down that much, but but they both went down a lot. Um, the 50-50 or the 60-40, 60-40 went down two-thirds. So, But to your point earlier, Paul, uh, you know, about the story gets better when you mix it with bonds. If you look at the the sharp ratio, which is a measure of return per unit of risk, the S&P 500 or the 100% uh, combination of equities, 50% S&P 500, 50% small cap value, both have about the same return per unit of risk at 0 0.64, 0 0.65. But by the time you get to a 60-40, that goes up to 0 0.8. So that's quite a bit better return per unit of risk. So, so there is a really good story in here for diversification. Yeah. So what that says is that the the fact that the sharp ratios are the same says that you're that you are essentially compensated for the increased volatility with an increased return, and they're a, a, a equivalent. And and at the sixty forty risk, at the sixty forty, you're getting most of the return with significantly less volatility because the worst drawdown is 67% instead of up in the 80s. Somebody who is going to demand to have 40% in bonds, then uh, we want the equity portion to be a combination of S&P 500 and small cap value, right? They're going to make an extra one and a half maybe percent or one and a quarter percent. It could also be a four fund combo, um, but yes. we would like to, yeah, but we would, or, or, or an ultimate buy and hold, but we would like them to have that half in small, half in large, half in value, half in blend kind of diversification. Cause it's yeah. just like the bonds, a way to improve your return per unit of risk. Yeah. yeah. Let me, let me bring this back for a second and, and, and just point one thing out here. Um, if you look at the 6040 and compare it to the S&P 500, the S&P 500 had a 9.9% CAGR, the 6040 had a 9.6% CAGR. The standard deviation for the 6040 is much less than the S&P 500. More than and the, and the uh sharp ratio was much much higher than the S&P 500. So this is a case where you you get essentially the same return at less volatility, but you but you get more return per unit risk for that volatility. And and there's one last really bright piece to the story, and that's down at the safe withdrawal rates. The safe withdrawal yeah. rate and the perpetual withdrawal rate are both the they're the maximum for the sixty forty portfolio with five point five percent. Right. I don't know a retiree who wouldn't be happy to be able to safely take <laughs> out five and a half percent increasing with inflation every year. That's a stunning result. Yeah. 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 And there's some there's something well, else. Well, and the and the thing that you pointed out earlier, Chris, is what. You know, you can argue about whether safe withdrawal rates mean anything or not, and nobody actually does that. And 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 all of the arguments about about sustainable or safe withdrawal rates, but when you look at them as resilience to sequence of returns risk, then the sixty forty over this ninety whatever it was year period ninety five year period um, is is much more resilient. Them. Yeah, it's the it's the SUV. It's the uh, sport utility vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> All terrain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and let me say that it is possible that the amount of money we save is partially dependent upon how confident we are in the outcome. Mm -hmm. And so it is possible that the person who's in a 60-40 strategy would have more confidence uh and uh, uh and put more money in and so for the little that they lose between the 9.6 and the 9.9 .9 could be made up with a, a relatively small amount of additional uh investments so that that too is a a, a possibility well gentlemen yeah if you go to a 65 35 
right in here. Yeah. Probably get the same return as that. And your and yep. your safe withdrawal rate is probably about the same. So yeah. So we we've got a long time. We've got more questions, but we're not gonna take them for two reasons. I've completely missed my nap. I mean, I just want you to know that I have to go on to my next meeting without a nap. And oh my I, I got about four hours of sleep last night. So uh, I, I want that to be the excuse for uh, the quality of my answers today. So thanks, you guys, a lot. I really appreciate your help. And uh, uh, this uh, next week, I'm very excited because we're going to be releasing a whole bunch of, I think we're going to have the, the the presentation available on our channel for your presentation, uh, Chris, down at Orange County. And uh, hopefully we'll have the ability to uh, give people a link to sign up for the October 11th presentation that Chris and I are making uh, uh, in Manhattan, New York City, Chris. Uh, the fact that we're doing it from California and uh, Washington is nice, isn't it? It's Not very nice. Fly back there. But anyway, we uh, we appreciate everybody coming out and joining us. Keep the questions coming. Uh, I see them best if they just come to to uh, Paul at paulmerriman.com. Uh, I don't know, uh, Chris, the questions. Where do you have people send your questions? Do they go through info or do they go to you? Uh, some go to me, but I'm behind, so it's probably better to have them come to you and have you prioritize and send them my way if I need to okay. answer. Okay, happy to do that. What about you, Daryl? Are you getting many questions? Uh, not so many, and okay. that's that's fine. I, I'm I'm more <laughs> of a nit, I'm more of a niche guy. Uh, and, okay, and you guys well. are the big thinkers, so <laughs> I see. I'm happy to cede that ground to you. Well, I think you, you just yeah, I think you just called us fat heads, Paul. <laughs> Wait a minute. He it's our niche, I think. That's great. <laughs> All right, you guys, take care and have a have a great weekend.